This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Patients frequently present to primary care offices, urgent care, and emergency departments with musculoskeletal injuries such as fractures, sprains, and dislocations. Many distal extremity injuries can be initially managed in an outpatient setting using basic splinting techniques. Splinting immobilizes injured extremities and prevents further injury, decreases pain and bleeding, and allows healing to begin. While there are many indications for splinting an extremity, three main types of injuries are commonly treated in outpatient settings. Fractures. Splinting is used to stabilize fractures of the upper and lower extremity, providing patient comfort and maintaining proper bone alignment. Dislocations. After reduction of a dislocated joint, splinting is used to maintain anatomic reduction during healing. Sprains. Splinting may be used to maintain the position of function and to alleviate pain for patients with ligamentous sprains. While there are no absolute contraindications to applying a temporary splint to an injured extremity, there are some unique circumstances that must be considered. The natural swelling of an extremity that occurs in the initial phase of healing can lead to challenges in determining the safest method of immobilization. Circumferential casting of an extremity fracture is often avoided in the acute setting, as continued swelling can lead to neurovascular compromise inside a rigid cast. Splints are an excellent alternative because they provide the necessary immobilization while allowing for the natural swelling process to occur without marked neurovascular compression. For injuries that are prone to severe swelling, even a splint can become restrictive as the swelling increases. Additional padding may allow room for expansion in these circumstances. The presence of neurovascular compromise at presentation mandates reduction of the injury to establish vascular perfusion of the extremity prior to splinting and definitive care. An orthopedic specialist should be consulted for fractures requiring urgent surgical evaluation, such as open fractures, which may require operative management. Temporary splints can be placed to alleviate pain and to prevent additional injury while awaiting evaluation by a specialist. Use appropriate universal precautions for potential exposure to bodily fluids when open wounds are present. The materials needed for basic extremity splint placement include a stockinette, cotton padding, plaster or fiberglass rolls or sheets, elastic bandages with clips or adhesive tape, heavy-duty scissors, and a bucket of water. Use sheets or pads to protect the patient's clothing during splint application whenever possible. As an alternative to plaster rolls or sheets, you may also use prefabricated splint materials. Before placing a splint, carefully examine the injured extremity. Failure to expose the injury site fully may result in unidentified injuries and subsequent poor outcomes. Evaluate pulses, motor function, and sensory function to determine whether emergency intervention or evaluation by a specialist is necessary. Treat skin or soft tissue injuries appropriately before placing a splint. Analgesics or anesthetics may be necessary to control pain during the splinting procedure. Place the patient in a comfortable position that allows you to have adequate access to all sides of the injured extremity. Remove all jewelry from the involved extremity before beginning splint placement. This section demonstrates the application of a volar splint to an upper extremity. Apply the stockinette to the extremity, avoiding wrinkles and using sufficient length to extend 10 centimeters beyond each end of the splint. Use scissors to cut an opening for the thumb. Cut a small hole in the stockinette where it lies across the base of the thumb and then pull over the digit to prevent wrinkles. Use cotton padding material to pad the injured extremity for comfort and to allow for anticipated swelling. Wrap the padding around the extremity, overlapping the previous layer by 25-50% to 50 to place two layers of padding over the entire area. In areas of bony prominence or expected irritation, apply extra layers of padding. If substantial swelling is expected, continue wrapping for 3-4 to four layers of protection. The cotton material can easily be stretched or torn as needed for uniform application. Take care to avoid too much circumferential pressure caused by excessive stretching of the padding during the application. Select a piece of dry plaster that is slightly wider than the limb to be immobilized. Measure the length of the splint material required 
and then cut or tear the dry plaster material to the appropriate length. Use at least 8 layers of plaster material for upper extremity splints and 12 layers for lower extremity splints to provide adequate strength to the completed splint. Consider using the unaffected extremity to measure the length of plaster that will be needed to limit the discomfort caused by moving the injured limb. Use additional layers of plaster if extra strength is required, keeping the total splint thickness less than 24 layers to minimize the risk of thermal injury from the plaster as it dries. Fill a bucket with lukewarm water less than 50 degrees Celsius and immerse the plaster material until it is saturated. Hold the wet plaster sheets vertically over the bucket and use two fingers to manually compress the layers in a downward motion. This removes wrinkles and excess water and will laminate the layers together. Place the plaster material over the cotton padding. Smooth the plaster to mold to the contours of the extremity in the appropriate anatomical position. Apply an additional layer of cotton padding to hold the splint in place and fold the ends of the stockinette back over the splint. Use an elastic bandage to secure the splint in place by wrapping it in a distal to proximal direction. Avoid excessive compression of the extremity when applying this elastic bandage. Before the plaster dries, place the extremity in the desired anatomic position. Use the palms of your hands to mold the splint gently to the extremity taking care to avoid creating indentations that might lead to pressure points. Allow the splint to dry without further manipulation or patient movement. Avoid resting the splint on a pillow during this time as heat buildup can cause thermal injuries as the plaster dries. Once the splint has dried completely, check for adequate immobilization, strength of splint, and patient comfort. A volar splint can be used to immobilize a sprained wrist, a triquetral fracture or lunate dislocation, or a second through fifth metacarpal head fracture. This splint should extend along the volar aspect of the forearm from the metacarpal heads to just proximal to the radial head, allowing unencumbered flexion of the elbow. Place the forearm in a neutral position with the thumb upward and the wrist in 20 degrees of extension. Ulnar gutter splints are designed to immobilize fractures along the ulnar aspect of the hand, including injuries to the fourth and fifth phalanges and metacarpals. This splint extends from the distal interphalangeal joint of the little finger to the proximal forearm. Place the forearm in a neutral position with the wrist in 20 degrees of extension. The metacarpal phalangeal joints should be flexed at 50 degrees, with the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints in slight flexion. Thumb spica splints are applied to the radial aspect of the forearm to immobilize the thumb and prevent flexion and extension of the wrist. This splint is useful for fractures of the scaphoid and lunate, first metacarpal, and thumb. This splint extends from the tip of the thumb to the proximal forearm. Place the forearm in a neutral position with the wrist in 20 degrees of extension and the thumb slightly flexed. A long arm splint will immobilize proximal forearm and elbow fractures. It can also provide temporary stabilization of intraarticular fractures of the distal humerus and olecranon while awaiting surgical care. When splinting a joint at an angle, be sure to wrap the extremity in the expected final position. Avoid excessive padding around the anterior aspect of the elbow joint in long arm splints, as this can result in skin pressure points and swelling under the splint. This splint prevents flexion and extension of the elbow and limits supination and pronation of the forearm. It extends along the posterior arm from the wrist to the proximal humerus. Place the elbow in 90 degrees of flexion while maintaining a neutral position for the forearm and wrist. A forearm sugar tong splint is used for wrist and distal forearm fractures. It immobilizes the wrist and forearm and prevents supination and pronation of the forearm. The splint extends from the metacarpal phalangeal joints on the dorsum of the hand, along the forearm, around the elbow, and back to the volar aspect of the mid-palmar crease. Place the elbow in 90 degrees of flexion while maintaining a neutral position for the forearm and wrist. A posterior leg splint is used to stabilize severe sprains, reduced ankle dislocations, and fractures of the distal leg, ankle, and foot. The splint extends from the metatarsal heads to just below the fibular head while maintaining a 90 degree angle at the ankle. Be sure to keep the fibular head free to avoid compression of the adjacent perineal nerve. Lower extremity splints are not designed for weight bearing and the patient should use crutches to walk safely. Adding a lateral stirrup component to a posterior leg splint increases splint stability and prevents inversion or eversion of the ankle.
This splint provides greater mobilization and stability for fractures near the ankle. The stirrup splint is similar to the sugar tong splint for the upper extremity. Apply the splint to the medial and lateral leg extending from the tibial tuberosity to wrap around the foot and end just below the fibular head. Mold the splint with the ankle at a 90 degree angle. Commercially available ankle splints may be used to enhance comfort after a sprain, but typically do not provide the necessary stability for fractures. Similar products are available for upper extremity sprains, such as a soft wrist splint. Prefabricated splinting materials are available and can be used to create a wide variety of splints for injured extremities using modifications of the techniques demonstrated in this video. Re-evaluate the extremity immediately after completing the splint placement. Evaluate distal motor and sensory function. Palpate for pulses, evaluate the color of the extremity, and assess for appropriate capillary refill. Be sure that the completed splint is comfortable and not overly restrictive and that the patient's pain is controlled. Address any discomfort by applying additional cotton padding or loosening the elastic bandage. Typical care after the application of a splint should include extremity elevation, application of ice packs, administration of analgesics, and appropriate communication of instructions for medical follow-up. Instruct the patient to keep the splint clean and dry and not to remove it until instructed. Give the patient verbal instructions and an easily understood written list of signs and symptoms that would necessitate urgent return for further evaluation. These include development of any signs of neurovascular compromise or compartment syndrome, such as increased swelling, worsening of pain, discoloration of the distal extremity, difficulty moving the fingers or toes, or change in sensory function. Splinting plays a major role in the initial management of musculoskeletal injuries, particularly those involving extremity fractures, joint dislocations, and severe sprains. A properly applied splint will stabilize the injured extremity, increase patient comfort, and allow the healing process to begin. Depending on the type of injury, a splint may be the only treatment required, or it may be an important temporizing measure until further evaluation or surgical intervention is completed.